<clears throat> Murder! <laughs> Ain't it fun? <clears throat> All right, we are back in Sherlock. Sherlockland, old 19th century London. And today's uh, episodes will be the Tin Soldier. Let's see who died. <laughs> yep. May we be of some assistance, Inspector Smythe? General Farnsworth Armstead, one of the six surviving Waterloo Tontine ticket holders, has been murdered. Waterloo Tontine? Yeah, the that's Waterloo Tontine thought. was a lottery of sorts, Watson. It was set up in 1815 to aid the veterans of the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington's victory over Napoleon. Yes, of course, I knew that. Quite an ingenious plan on the part of the founders. One pound bought a ticket in the name of some young relative. The ticket proceeds amounted to over a million pounds. Half went immediately to veterans and their families for medical and hardship expenses. What became of the other half? It all went into an account at the Bank of England, where it's been collecting interest all these years. Very clever. And mm. how does one win this prize? Simply by outliving all the other ticket holders. Mm. And now you say one of them has been murdered. Very suspicious. Who are the remaining five? The oldest is Captain Robert Jurgens, age 82. Then there are Anita and Claire Thomas, who are 80-year-old twins. William Rowland is 79, and Peter Dudley is 77. Poor General Armstead was the youngest at 74. Seems as if he would have had the best chance to outlive the others. I recall reading something in the Times about a big to-do involving the Tontine survivors on the 18th. That's correct. The Waterloo Anniversary Banquet at the Langham Hotel. Why is the name Armstead familiar? He was a noted art collector, I believe. He also authored a well-known book, Treasures of the Conquerors. Quite right. At the hmm. time of his death, General Armstead was working on a revised edition for his publisher, Nugget and Company. It was to contain an entirely new chapter on a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star, which at one point belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. The general had new information which traced the gem to its present owner. Tell me about the circumstances of General Armstead's death. Oh, yes, of course. Well, let me see. At 10 o'clock this morning, the general's valet, David Stennett, admitted a call to the general's study. Senate says he did not know the man. He was elderly and spoke with a French accent. Senate told him the general never saw anyone in the morning while he was at work. The gentleman insisted that if Armstead read the letter he had with him, he would make an exception. And so it was. Senate took the letter in, Armstead read it, and went quite pale. He told Senate to let the gentleman in. Sensing something amiss, Senate dawdled in the area of the study for the next 15 minutes or so. Then he heard the distinct sound of sword play. He tried to enter the study, but found the door locked. Then he heard the crash of breaking glass. He raced to the kitchen and out the back door to enter the study from the garden. By the time he got there, the caller had vanished, and the general was leaning heavily against a shattered display case of military miniatures. Before Senna could assist him, he dropped a saber from his hand and fell over dead. And I take it the letter which so upset the general was nowhere to be found. Correct, Mr. Holmes. Well, we shall put our brains and our feet to the task. Okay. I didn't get all the names of the other survivors, but... Okay. If we can do it, we can. All right, um, so I'm wondering if this, hmm, um, okay, well, there's the, uh, an obvious motive, however, there's also this issue of the polar star diamond that could be complicating things. Hmm, sounds like a side quest. Could be, yep. Okay, so, uh, perhaps we should first go to, um, more? Or, yeah. or or the scene of the crime. 
Let's see. Uh, scene of the crime might be good. Um, Armistead. Armistead. General Farnsworth. Farnsworth. Armstead. What? No, it was on the first page. Uh, Armstead. Is oh, oh. Okay. Let's check it out. I found the general leaning over the display case. He had his saber in hand, the one that usually resides above the fireplace. Mm -hmm. I understand he was a collector of military figures. Yes, the display in the study shows the last great British charge that swept the French from Waterloo. Is there any significance to the fact that the figure of Napoleon is facing backwards? Hmm. Strange. Perhaps I should go and set it straight. No, don't touch it. Not until the police have concluded their investigation. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I also noticed the portrait over the display case. The late Mrs. Arnstead. Do I detect a note of hostility? I must admit we did not get on very well. But I might say that Mrs. Armstead did not get on very well with anyone, including the general. You mean they didn't marry for love? Hardly. Lord Fitch, Mrs. Armstead's father, arranged the match. Lord Fitch? The dowry was Lord very Finch. generous. Finch. Lord Fitch would have paid any amount to ensure that he would not be left with a spinster daughter, especially such a nasty one. If there was no love lost Jeez. between them, why did he keep her portrait in his study? Actually, it was put up there to needle... Mrs. Arnstead's brother, the present Lord Fitch. He never approved of the marriage. Even after her death, they were involved with mutual business affairs. They jointly owned stock or some such thing. Tell me, do you know what mm. the general was doing at the time the intruder arrived? Yes, he was working on the new section of his book. The part that concerns the gem, the Polar Star, it was very interesting, really. It traces the ownership of the gem to the brother of Napoleon, to the Russian Count Rostov. Unfortunately, the gem was stolen from the Count three years ago. As a matter of fact, the general just received a letter from a Pierre Montan who said that he was willing to divulge the name of the present owner of the gem for the agreed upon fee. Do you know where Mr. Montan might be found? I believe he's staying at the Bridge House Hotel. Did the general have any encounters with Bridge anyone out of the ordinary in the past several days? Not really. An old friend of his has been in town, Jean-Paul Girard. Neither the Jean general Paul nor I have seen him in 40 years. In fact, they were going to meet this afternoon at the French embassy. I'm obviously curious about mm. the general's last visitor. Could you describe him, please? He was an old man, a rather short fellow, he walked with a cane and carried a carpet bag. Did he give a name? No, no. He simply wanted to see the general, and he handed me a letter to take into him. Did you read it? No, no. It was in an envelope. Rather yellowed with age. Though I noticed it was addressed in a graceful hand to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars, the general's old regiment. When the general read it, he went very pale. Then he asked me to admit the gentleman. Tell me, when you finally got into the room from the garden, were the study doors still locked? Yes. I noticed that there is an eight-foot fence surrounding the garden, and that the only way into the garden or out of it is through the kitchen door or the study. How terribly observant, Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is what he's known for. Yes. So, ooh, so a few things jumped out at me. Okay. This, uh, um, the butler guy said that an old friend of the general, Jean-Paul Girard, um, was in town and was going to meet with him later at the French embassy. French embassy. But then we were told at the beginning that this mysterious visitor had a French accent. Hmm. And he just said that he... Uh, he had a cane, and I'm think, and I've been thinking, how did the general get stabbed? Ooh, the sword and the cane, mm. old thing. Maybe. Should Maybe. we go to the French embassy? Um, then there's Lord Finch, who doesn't like the guy, I assume. And then he said something about somebody was staying at the Bridge House Hotel. Mm -hmm. I forget who. <laughs> yeah. An old friend. Another old friend. There's so many 
Yeah. Tangled web. Anyway, uh, whichever you want. Let's try the French Embassy. Parmi and I spent over a year quartered together in France in war college. We became the best of friends. Did you know much of the general's personal life at the time? Ah, he always put the rest of us to shame in the matters of love. Said it was because we had no horse face to spur us on. Did the general have a passion for horses? Mon Dieu, no. He was engaged to a terribly unattractive woman by the name of Mary Jeez. Fitch. Mary Fitch. Behind her back, that's what he called her. Horse face. How dreadful. Uh, whatever became of her? She eventually became Mrs. Armstead and brought her great fortune to the marriage. I believe that Farney looked upon his stay in France as his last great fling. Are you saying that there was no particular woman at the time? I did not say that. There was one, but I never met her. My little flower, he called her. I remember one night he could not sleep. He was slightly drunk, and he kept rambling on about promises that must be kept and promises that couldn't be. Finally, he collapsed on the bed with such sadness in his eyes, I will never forget it. Ma Florette, he said. Oh, very touching. My flower. <clears throat> have you seen much of the general over the years? We have always maintained our friendship through correspondence. Until last week, that is. It was the first time we had seen each other in over 40 years. We had supper, and then went to see the French actor Philippe Arnaud perform. The general commented that my presence beside him while French was being spoken reminded him of the old days. So your visit went well? Exceedingly well. Can you think of anything that might have been troubling him? No, the general was in excellent spirits. He joked about the upcoming Tontine celebration at the Langham. And he was Tontine very enthusiastic celebration? about the new oh, information yeah, the lottery. concerning the Polar Star. In fact, this week he was supposed to meet with a countryman of mine about it. Uh, it is hard to right. believe oh. that my good friend is countryman. Gone. Okay, uh, that's who was uh, the butler mentioned was in town at the Bridge House Hotel. Somebody who claimed to have information on the Polar Star. And if he's Jean Paul's countryman, that could be another French suspect. Well, Bridge House is here. Mm -hmm. Shall we visit? See if he has a cane. See if he's short. <laughs> How in the world did you hear about it so soon, Mr. Holmes? The body's still warm. Couldn't have happened all the time, Mr. Holmes. Body? What body? <laughs> for the one that's upstairs in 203. I'm here for something else, Two, actually. Three. Looking for Pierre Martin. Well, that's the very fellow what was done in. Uh, oh, jeez. Well, Mr. Matin checked into the hotel on the 8th. He was a Frenchman. I, I didn't speak to him much. Who discovered the body? I did. Well, I came along to his room to deliver a wire. Here it is, sir. Information still valuable. See me, Wells Osborne, Norgate and Company Publishers. Norgate Company. and Company? Did you see anyone suspicious hanging about? No. No, sir. Well, actually, now that I think about it, there was a rather large man with a foreign accent. Russian, I think. He said mm. that he wasn't sure about the address and that he'd only just arrived in London. He asked for Mr. Matin, and I sent him straight up. Well, he was rather well-spoken and well-mannered. I didn't think anything of it at the time. A few minutes later, he came down. He was practically running. I saw him go out the front door and hail a cab. Was there anything amiss in the room? Cough. I'll say. An inkwell was toppled on its side. Left an awful mess on the carpet. Big blue spots and inky footprints right the way to the door. The manager will be in a fret when he sees it. Fortunately, there was no blood. Perhaps he was strangled. Hmm. We had a heart attack. So there's a little guy with a cane doing people in, and there's also a big guy. Was maybe the guy that just died was the little guy with the cane? Um, could be. They could be killing each other off. This could be the side story. This, this could be about the diamond. Hmm. If the diamond is a side story. Because that, that little note the bellhop was trying to deliver was from the general's book publisher. You know, he was going to publish an updated version of his book talking about the diamond. Right. And the note said, uh, information still valuable. So they must have heard about him, his death. 
and they knew this Pierre Martin was going to give him updated info. Could be. <laughs> so what was there was a third thing from that first visit, uh, third lead. Um, other than the hotel, well, let's see the 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 the, the Waterloo Tong team was supposed to have a banquet at the Longwen Motel. Longwen. Uh, the Bank of England, England is holding their funds. The Longham. Longham. Or oh, okay. So we I'd, could go there. Um, but that's just where I suppose they could have the name of the, the names of the people in the group. There's Lord Finch, uh, who's the Fitch. Fitch, who was his brother-in-law, and they have business dealings together. Yeah, I I kind of wondered about that because he is the brother of uh, the unfortunate-looking woman, I guess. That yes, <laughs> <laughs> he was married to, and I guess there was some business dealings, but also some bad blood. Mm -hmm. So, shall we visit him or that hotel? I don't know what the hotel would tell us. Okay. Well, let's visit Lord Fitch. I admit I strongly disliked Armstead. He was the cad who made my sister's life miserable. I argued at length with my father against the marriage, but to no avail. But what was your sister's opinion at the time? Well, unfortunately, Mary was not the attractive sort who had scores of suitors. My father was afraid she'd be left to spinster. The engagement was arranged just before Armistead went to France. During the year he was gone, I had him watched and discovered he was in the thick of some scandal involving a young French girl. Mm -hmm. And you told your father? Well, he wouldn't listen. I even went so far as to give the story to the newspapers. But my father got wind of it and used his influence to prevent its publication. I would have done anything to keep my sister away from that man. Including murder? Why, why, that's preposterous. Well, surely you don't think... I was scheduled to meet with Armistead today. But you see, my wife took ill. I spent the whole morning attending to her here until Dr. Ainstree arrived at around 11 o'clock. Hmm. It was about 10 o'clock this morning that the guy was killed again. What? I guess we could <clears throat> go to that doctor to confirm his alibi, but... So it, it seems that um, Armstead was in some sort of arrangement or pickle in France when he was there and involved this <coughs> uh, little flower, whoever mm -hmm. this uh, girl was. And he was quite torn up about it. So perhaps those who killed him might have had something to do with whatever that pickle was. I just can't. I don't know. Maybe. Well, it, he was he was engaged, and and then he went off to war, and then and he came back in France and had a fling, and oh so scandalous he was engaged. How dare he? Um, I don't know if this is very much to go on. Shall we go to the hotel and see if it surprises us? I guess we could track down some of these names of this other survivors of this Waterloo group. Since one of them, since all of them have a motive of wanting him dead. But Let's try the hotel. Okay. <laughs> it seems none of the staff knows anything about Armstead's demise. The yeah. manager was rather grateful I told him the news. Says now they can count on one less place setting at the banquet. Then I suppose it was a good thing we stopped here, Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a good deed for the day. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's think about these other people that. Yeah. So the only only two of the five names did I get. One was a Captain Robert Jurgens. With a Y. A J, I think, is how it's spelled. Jurgens. Robert Jurgens. Mm -hmm. All right, good as any. Uh, Captain, did you know General Armstead? Armpit, you say? <laughs> dead, Armstead. Oh, Armstead. I knew that bloke. A jolly good fellow. Uh, sat next to me at the last shindig back in 65. The 50th anniversary and all of that rot. 
Uh, we had a grand old time swapping lies about her adventures on foreign shores. Uh, he swore by French damsels, but I argued for the China ladies. <laughs> I hope they catch the death rat who killed him and hang him proper. Have you seen the general since the 1865 banquet? I've never seen a general with a blanket. No, no since <laughs> the banquet. No. No. May I ask, what are your plans for the Tontine money, should you win it? To spend as much of it as I can while I'm still alive and kicking. Leave the rest of it to the Siemens Fund when I'm dead. Or some people think I should leave it to my only kin, uh, my nephew, Booth Lacey. I never would, mind you. He's nephew? a bit of a laggard. He's never done an honest day's work in his life. So mm. I'll ask the others to be found the next day with the skull bastion. Look to Booth. <laughs> He's sure to be holding that club in his hand. He's got a cane. He's got a short. Huh. Could maybe this nephew impersonated him? That's a that's possible. What was the nephew's name? Uh, Lacey. It, he'd Is have the same name, Lacey? right? Not necessarily. Jurgens. Lacey might be the last name, or like Lacey Lackey, something. Lacey, I thought Lacey was a lackey. Lindsay, Booth Lacey, that's it. Booth Lacey. Mm-hmm. I don't know. This might be a dead end. Dead but... end, but I've got a feeling here. What did you discover, Watson? <laughs> he wasn't in Holmes, though his landlady suggested we might try the Red Bull Inn. The Red Bull Inn. Talked my ear off. Went on and on about how Lacey constantly plays up to his uncle, Captain Jurgens, who's one of those old gents with the ticket in the Tontine. Thought she'd never hush up. Hmm. So apparently, this nephew is very well aware that he might have money coming. The Red what? Red Bull Inn. Maybe that's a. Uh... Or or the uh, bar or pub or. Yeah, I thought he said inn. Red Red Bull Inn. Hmm. Okay. We'll put it after the, the inns, huh? I was wondering if you'd seen a Mr. Booth Lacey around here today. Nope. Must be my lucky day. Well, then, if it's your lucky day, why not spread some good cheer in the form of a pint and some food to that unfortunate chap standing outside your door? Poor bloke is missing an arm and a leg. <laughs> that poor huh. bloke's your one and only Booth Lacey. Well, the whole thing's an act. He's as normal as you and me. Spends half his time begging out front and the other half swindling folks down at London Bridge Station. Huh. London Bridge Station. So he's a swindler and an actor and in costume. I think he impersonated his uncle and... Get on down to London Bridge Station. Chase him around. Station. Uh, London something station. Train? Would it be under train or London Bridge, Bridge station. station? I thought they said Booth or something. Yeah, their pronunciation makes this game tricky. Mr. Lacey, <laughs> I see you still make your living by strapping your arms and legs behind you and fooling the poor public out of its tuppence. Man's got to make a living somehow. What can I do for you, Holmes? I want to ask you about the murder of General Armstead. General who? Really? Perhaps you can fool some of the public some of the time, but you can never fool Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that General Armstead. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Where else would I be? I was at church. You, Lacey, at church? It hardly seems like it. I swear, at St. Mary's, they pass out soup and bread every morning at 9.30. The father will vouch for me. You can even ask him. I may just do precisely that. <laughs> I don't know. It seems too easy. I know, but they're spending so much time giving us video clips. <laughs> and they're entertaining <laughs> video clips, so I don't care if it's a purpose. Maybe, maybe the father's in on it and is going to get a cut of the money. What was the place? St. Mary's? I think so. Under. Okay. So... There's St. Oh, it was. Oh, oh. Abbreviations are first. Yeah, lovely, huh? I was wondering, Father, if you happen to know a man by the name of Booth Lacey. 
I should say that I do. I see him every morning. At Vespers? Wish that it were. No, at our soup kitchen. We can pray for the unfortunates of this world, certainly. But we can also offer them a little sustenance of a more nourishing kind. Every morning at 9.30, our doors are thrown open to those less privileged than ourselves. And every morning, without fail, Du Plessis is here. You're certain of that? I am. You see, with only one arm, he needs someone to carry his bowl to the table. Invariably, I am that someone. It's like the perfect alibi. <laughs> yeah, but he's... He doesn't have just one arm? Hmm, maybe it's a really red, bright red herring. <laughs> that could be. I wonder, oh, the if you could go, um, could, could we, oh, the, the, the guy's face, that's where you ask the, the Baker Street irregulars, like the street urchins who know the underworld and they can give you the, they like spy on places for you and they tell you what's really going on. Right. They, they would know if he was actually there at St. Mary's. Oh. I think. The father sees Lacey every morning at the soup kitchen. We may make it a regular stopping place ourselves. Ah. Uh.